I'm going to be talking about the fan de siècle. And just to get it out of the way from the beginning, let's look at that phrase which seems to cause so much difficulty for people in terms of pronunciation. So here I've written it out as it sounds. Fan de siècle. Fan de siècle. Okay, so that's how we pronounce it. But what does fan de siècle refer to? Here is the overview of what I'm going to be talking about um, over the next uh, 40 minutes or thereabouts. Um, beginning with uh, a discussion of um, pessimism, philosophical pessimism, and um, what that means, how that um, connects to the idea of the fin de siècle as, as an, an idea of about things coming to an end, the end of a certain kind of um, optimistic philosophy, um, but also the end of the Victorian period, the end of the 19th century, the great industrialising period, the, the period that heralded in ideas of modernity and all the kind of early utopian things that that, uh, that seemed to promise. So the idea of the fin de siècle coming at the, the end of the 19th century therefore has all these sorts of connotations that these early dreams of promise um, of a kind of heralding in a, a new world of modernity in some sense was kind of entering into a, a more pessimistic period. Um, connected to that is uh, is this idea of uh, ennui, a French word like fin de siècle, ennui, um, which reflects a sense of, of a kind of boredom or exhaustion um, that, that's connected to pessimism, but rather than it being so much of a philosophical um, sense of, of uh, an end point or a kind of an exhaustion, here there's more of a sense that all the kind of excitement of modernity produces a sort of countervailing tendency, which is that of a kind of um, uh, sensation raised to the level where one is simply worn out by it, that, uh, that one is, is bored, um, uh, overstimulated, enervated, and uh, filled with this, this kind of um, saturation um, that results in, in, in ennui, this, this French kind of term. Ennui itself is associated um, via uh, writers such as Charles Baudelaire with the idea of decadence. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about decadence and um, how through the, the decadent movements, um, particularly through uh, figures like Oscar Wilde, that French influence um, comes to inhabit um, English literary uh, culture and indeed English culture more generally. Hence the term how fin de siècle becomes imported as, as part of uh, British culture. Um, and then a, a term, again, associated with decadence, but having slightly um, more narrow connotations uh, in terms of the idea of, of both cultural and physical decline, this notion of degeneration, and spinning off from that um, two responses to the idea of degeneration. One of them, um, a kind of scientific response or scientistic response, and I'll explain that term when I get to it, um, and the other, uh, an attempt to counteract the idea of degeneration through the celebration of empire and the advent of um, what uh, was referred to as the new imperialism. Okay, so that's the the overall canvas that I'm going to be looking at, so these sorts of um, ideas about modernity, the cultural manifestations of those, the artistic uh, developments, and then the sort of, again, feeding into these broader um, sorts of concerns around degeneration. So, on to pessimism. So, the idea of pessimism is uh, obviously opposed to the idea of optimism. That is to say, it's a, a sense of um, a, 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 an attitude towards the world, towards culture, towards the future, which is essentially negative. Um, the term pessimism is often associated with the philosophy of the German uh, early 19th century romantic philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer and Arthur Schopenhauer um, wrote uh, a book called The World as Will and Idea, one of his most influential books um, but his, his general outlook was one in which he saw um, the world and everything in it as something which is produced by the individual's perception and in particular the idea that all creatures are born with uh, an innate sense of, of desire, of will. So the world is that which one wills into being through one's own desires. Now, the reason why this um, is associated with pessimism is because um, Schopenhauer perceives within this idea of 
the world as something which is produced by will and by desire, um, a, a fundamental problem. And that fundamental problem is that um, pleasure, um, the, the kind of optimistic sides of life, are things which she sees as essentially negative. Pleasure is something which is produced when a, a, a desire is satisfied, and insofar as that desire is satisfied, it leaves you um, wanting. It, he sees pleasure and satisfaction, in other words, as essentially negative things. Uh, pleasure is what what results from the counteraction of pain, uh, of loss, of, of of you know the absence of the thing that you want. So, it, it is life is essentially negative. Not only that, but if you keep on satisfying desires, eventually you get bored of them. You know it, it no longer works. So for Schopenhauer, life is essentially suspended between these two poles. Of on the one hand, the pain of loss or absence of the thing which is desired, and then on the other hand, the boredom which ensues from repeatedly having access to the thing which one desires. So, as it says here, uh, for Schopenhauer, human existence is a pendulum to and fro between pain and boredom. And these two are, in fact, its ultimate constituents. So, that's Schopenhauer. Life is essentially a pendulum swinging between pain and boredom. You can in light of that kind of perspective, therefore, see how the idea of pessimism here, uh, exemplified in Edvard Munch's famous painting, The Scream, from 1893, precisely that fin de siècle moment that, uh, that we're interested in here. Um, one, can, one can see how that idea of pessimism is something which becomes uh, pervasive, particularly in the uh, absence of other sorts of structures which will give one confidence that there is more meaning to life as possible, because as I said, um, Schopenhauer's philosophy emerges from this kind of romantic conception of the self as the sort of the ultimate uh, grounding of all reality, that the world is that which is produced by the individual will. And that therefore cuts out all sorts of other things which might provide um, a, a more substantial grounding for reality, whether that's in terms of uh, a theology, um, a, a religion, whether that's in terms of sort of more overarching uh, belonging to a sense of nationhood or whatever it might be, for Schopenhauer it's all grounded in the individual, the individual's desires and the limitations that that imposes in terms of you know this alternating between pain on the one hand and, um, and boredom on the other. So hence we have this sense of, of pessimism. So the notion of pessimism and that, that connection with um, pain and boredom is intimately related to this second term um, of ennui. Now here um, I've got uh, a painting by Edgar Degas, uh, The Absinthe Drinker, from 1876. So a little bit earlier than the period of the fin de siècle, which really mostly covers um, the 1890s, really, or sort of stretching back a little bit into the 1880s maybe. Uh, but it's, it's most often seen uh, as, um, you know, the the last decade of the 19th century. Um, but as the terms, uh, the ad adoption of the terms ennui and fin de siècle would tend to suggest, there is a strong cultural import from France, um, a strong sense in which um, all this late Victorian angst is, um, is already something which is being explored in the arts and literature and philosophy of continental Europe. Um, and and in, in the influence of uh, of uh, the, the sort of cafe culture uh, and intellectual culture of Paris in particular, um, and going back even further um, than um, than Degas' picture of the absinthe drinker, which I should just point out here. I mean, look at the expression on the woman's face, um, that sort of sense of a kind of uh, hollowed out emptiness um, of, of her expression. She sits with the glass of absinthe on the table in front of her. Absinthe was a drink that's particularly sort of iconic um, in relation to this notion of ennui. It's a drink which not only is alcoholic but also has certain kinds of psychotropic properties um, that associate it with almost a kind of psychedelic um, kind of experience but not a kind of euphoric one but necessarily what you have here in a sense is a kind of an image of you know the junkie the drug addict, somebody who's kind of hollowed out by the pursuit of pleasure and vice and sensation. Um, so that's uh, ennui as, uh, as emblematized in this painting by Degas. Um, but going back even before Degas um, to 
uh, the middle of the 19th century, really, is uh, the figure of uh, Charles Baudelaire, um, whose collection of poems, Les Fleurs du Mal, from 1857, can be seen as one of the major sorts of catalysts for the emergence of the theme of ennui um, as, as kind of uh, characteristic of urban modernity, of you know, the 19th century city, um, and of the, uh, the, the poetics of, of ennui, not as something simply to be regretted and lamented and seen as, as a huge problem, not to take a high moralistic tone in relation to it and to see it addiction as a terrible thing which we need to protect uh, our, our young people from, uh, something to be uh, treated with horror, to be extirpated from culture. Instead, Baudelaire is very interested in uh, these sorts of uh, negative um, experiences, the, the idea of ennui, of boredom, of horror, uh, all these sorts of emotions which um, he sees as associated with the modern city, uh, with the 19th century. Um, satanic kind of values, really, um, are the things which uh, attract Baudelaire so much, hence the title Les Fleurs du Mal, The Flowers of Evil. Um, this is this is Baudelaire's uh, terrain, this is his topic and his, his subject matter. Um, and he begins the collection with a poem addressed to the reader. And uh, this is the uh, the final four stanzas uh, in English translation um, of that poem to the reader from uh, Les Fleurs du Mal, which really sets the stage uh, both for what's going to um, come in the poems that, uh, that he uh, publishes in this book, but also really kind of setting up the themes and in particular setting up the relationship between the reader and this, this uh, notion of ennui. So I, I shall read it out. If poison, fire, blade, rape do not succeed, in sewing on that dull embroidery of our pathetic lives, their artistry. It's that our soul, alas, shrinks from the deed. And yet, among the beasts and creatures all, panther, snake, scorpion, jackal, ape, hound, hawk, monsters that crawl and shriek and grunt and squawk in our vice-filled menagerie's catawall, one worse is there, fit to heap scorn upon, more ugly, rank, Though noiseless, calm and still, yet would he turn the earth to scraps and swill, swallow it whole in one great gaping yawn. Ennui, that monster frail, with eyes wherein a chance tear gleams, he dreams of gibbets while smoking his hooker with a dainty smile. You know him, reader, hypocrite, my twin. So in this last part of the poem to the reader, um, there are a number of things that I think are, are, are worth sort of picking out just uh, for a, a little bit of uh, focused attention. The first is that w what he starts off talking about is these categories of poison, fire, blade and rape, um, all negative, all um, subjects of, of, of violence or, or, or horror or death. Um, but they're treated here as um, as embroidery, embroidery on our pathetic lives, as, as artistry. Um, and if, as he says, um, if we are unable to, to embroider our lives with, with these things, it's because um, our soul, alas, shrinks from the deed. In other words, we're too afraid, we're too fearful, we're too timid to embrace this attitude towards, um, towards horror. And then he goes on and, and lists all these other kinds of... Um, uh, images of, of, of bestial um, and horrific kind of manifestations of vice, um, but the worst of all, he says, um, more more ugly and more rank than all of these, um, is something which is calm and still. It's not the, the kind of noisy, attention-grabbing sort of thing that, uh, that that he's described in the first two stanzas. Rather, it's something which is much more uh, devastating than all of these manifestations of violence and horror. Because it's something which could, as he says, turn the earth to scraps and swill, swallow it whole in one great gaping yawn. But this thing is ennui, is boredom. Uh, and it's, as he characterises it, um, with this um, eye wherein a chance tear gleams, he dreams of gibbets while smoking his hooker. It's very much, in other words, the same kind of image that Degas is painting of the absence drinker of someone consumed with ennui, staring into space, consumed with boredom, dreaming some kind of 
um, dreams of gibbets, of, of death, you know, of hanging, of suicide. Um, ennui is this, this terrible thing which, which is in danger of consuming the whole world. It's the kind of disease of the late 19th century, as, uh, as Baudelaire sees it. And as I say, it's not that he shies away from it. In fact, what he does is writes a book of poems about it, exploring it in all its manifestations and all its horrors as the truth, in his view, of, uh, of the 19th century. So, we've looked at um, pessimism, we've looked at ennui. Um, now, going back to pessimism, um, I mentioned Schopenhauer as, uh, as, as a kind of philosophical underpinning of the uh, idea of uh, pessimism. But Schopenhauer wrote uh, The World is Will and the Idea in 1818, I think, um, much more of a contemporaneous uh, fin de siècle philosopher is uh, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche's perspective on pessimism was a little different from Schopenhauer's um, because for Nietzsche, the idea of uh, pessimism was uh, about a loss of faith in all the um, uh, structures uh, that had given meaning to life previously. So religion, the state, the family, um, the, the, the idea of a, of a class system and everything else that provides um, authority or that provides a kind of justification or provides a moral framework. For Nietzsche, all of these things are essentially illusions. They are um, either cons that allow people to uh, perpetrate some sort of ideological advantage or they are simply uh, metaphors which have gradually hardened into things that are taken to be true, that are, that are taken as, as read and, and taken uh, uh, as, as normal. So for Nietzsche, the great thing about pessimism is the opportunity that it provides to smash away everything like that, to do away with religion, for example, to do away the, with the idea of God. For, for Nietzsche, the, the discovery of the, the 19th century was the death of God, and not only the death of God, but the idea that, that humanity itself was something which could be superseded in the, in the an idea he had of the Ubermensch, the Overman. Um, he, he described um, the human being as being a rope stretched between the beast and the, the Overman or the Superman. Um, humanity is, a, is not a, a thing, but is a, is a bridge, in other words, that, that it's, it's, uh, it's all about making a transition to a, to a, a more advanced stage. And this more advanced stage is one which is life lived without illusions. Hence the title of um, one of his final works, Twilight of the Idols, or How to Philosophise with a Hammer. The Twilight of the Idols is his um, welcoming of the decline of all the great um, icons and shibboleths and gods and celebrated values um, of, um, of human civilization. And for him, philosophising with a hammer is precisely the smashing up of all those things. So for Nietzsche... His pessimism wasn't like that of Schopenhauer's about a kind of an oscillation between pain and boredom, um, but rather it was about the opportunity that um, the fin de siècle, that this, this sense of, of a kind of an ending brings to create a, a world anew. So for Nietzsche, there is both this Dionysian impulse, um, as he would uh, term it, of, of kind of smashing up the existing order, and then this Apollonian impulse to build a new world um, on, on top of it. So you have that sense with the pessimism of the late 19th century and then the, the idea of the fin de siècle, that it's a kind of Janus-faced entity. It's, it's looking backwards um, at the past and, at, in a sense, the kind of the, the ruination of all the great um, hopes, all the um, hopes for, uh, for progress, all the hopes for um, a, a civilising uh, process. So it's looking at the kind of ruin of those things, the decline of, of the high Victorian aspirations. But at the same time, it's also looking forward and looking forward to the idea of modernity as, as something which might be um, post-theological, post-nationalist, uh, potentially. Although, of course, you know, it turns out to be none of these things. But, but there is this going hand in hand with this kind of um, destructive impulse uh, that looks towards the past, also a constructive impulse um, oriented towards creating um, this idea of, of an overman. Um, now... What I want to move on to now is to look at uh, decadence. Um, and my iconic figure here um, for decadence is, of course, uh, Oscar Wilde on the, uh, in the photograph on the left there. 
Uh, decadence is a, in itself a, a complicated term that um, that pulls in um, lots of different um, lots of different things. But broadly speaking, um, one could associate it with, on the one hand, uh, a kind of an artistic and intellectual movement um, that is along the same sorts of lines that uh, that Nietzsche's philosophy is interested in. That is to say, um, about uh, the discovery of new forms um, of of culture and new ways of life, um, and that is something which is heralded in by welcoming the decline of the old ones. So there is about decadence the idea that it's kind of celebrating decay. Um, there's um, one uh, one description of uh, decadence uh, at the time was that it's a flower that grows on graves. Um, this idea that that something beautiful emerges from the decay of the old. And that sort of uh, slightly queasy preoccupation with uh, with death and with deathliness is something which, which hovers over all of Baudelaire's writings, for example. Um, it's not there so much in Wilde. Um, I mean, Wilde flirts with um, with decadence and, and, uh, and, and with uh, some of those sorts of cultural references. Uh, but to some extent, what I think Wilde's... Um, Wilde's heralding of the new um, by the decline of the old um, appropriates really that sort of French discourse um, of decadence, partly because it's quite a useful tool for dismantling uh, Victorian Englishness. <coughs> uh, but I, I, I maybe said a little bit more about that in due course. But in any case, um, decadence has both its sort of intellectual manifestation, it also has uh, a sense of of popular cultural manifestation as well, and the idea of um, a decadent society, one in which uh, entertainment and mass culture uh, and those sorts of things are themselves gathering steam. Uh, decadence may also be associated with um, the ongoing um, progression of democratic reform in the 19th century, so that by the 1890s uh, the vote had been extended to most uh, men um, of, of uh, the age of majority, <coughs> with the result that um, there were very often discussions in the middle class press about uh, how we should educate our masters. The point being that uh, their masters, the, the masters of the, the you know what had up to that point been the social elite, were in fact the mass of the people, uh, or certainly the mass of the the, the male population of, of, of adult age. Um, that the majority of voters were now not what would have been considered to be educated middle class or upper class men. And so the question of education and of culture takes on a new uh, and pressing significance in, in the fact that, um, that the consumers of this um, culture themselves had a say over the ruling of the country. But, <coughs> to stay with Wilde for the time being, the, um, the term fin de siècle is one which actually crops up in uh, Wilde's uh, only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. And I just want to focus in on this passage uh, for a moment um, and just to sort of unpick really from it some of the, the themes um, of the fin de siècle that, that, uh, that Wilde is sort of threading through uh, the novel uh, and as indeed he threads through his plays as well. So this is uh, a scene from a party at which uh, Dorian Gray... Um, his mentor, if you like, his Mephistophelian mentor, Lord Henry Wotton, uh, are both present, <coughs> and they're they're talking to the, the hostess um, of this soiree that they're attending. And uh, and the hostess says to him, uh, says to both of them, in fact, um, if we women did not love you for your defects, where would you all be? Not one of you would ever be married. You would be a set of unfortunate bachelors. Not, however, that that would alter you much. Nowadays, all the married men live like bachelors, and all the bachelors like married men. Fin de siècle, murmured Lord Henry. Fin de globe, answered his hostess. I wish it were fin de globe, said Dorian with a sigh. Life is a great disappointment. Ah, my dear, cried Lady Narborough, putting on her gloves. Don't tell me that you have exhausted life. When a man says that, one knows that life has exhausted him. Lord Henry is very wicked, and I sometimes wish that I had been. But you are made to be good. You look so good. Okay, now I think there's there's quite a lot going on in this. Um, first of all, the uh, the bits that I've highlighted, uh, beginning with the idea that nowadays all the married men live like bachelors and all the bachelors like married men. Um, this idea that, uh, or the, the rather the, the the focus on on bachelors is itself uh, a relatively 
um, specific thing for the late nineteenth century. Um, the idea of um, of successful hegemonic masculinity um, in the mid nineteenth century was very much the image of the married man, the paterfamilias, the father and husband. Um, but by the end of the nineteenth century, and and with this sort of sense of of the fin de siècle of something. Uh, going into decline of a kind of an ending of, of Victorian values in in a sense um, that idea of masculinity is something which seems to have lost traction so that to be a bachelor was it was no longer seen as being a sign of of failure or or, or, um, or some kind of um, abnormality of some kind but rather to be a bachelor was seen as a, a kind of a, a life choice and the, there is um, statistical um, empirical evidence that uh, young men were delaying the point at which they got married significantly for a variety of reasons. Um, the historian of gender, John Tosh, um, has written about this uh, extensively and this idea of what he calls a, a flight from domesticity um, of, uh, of younger men in the late 19th century. So this idea of married men living like bachelors and bachelors like married men is, is very topical um, at the point of world writing. Um, but also, just think a little bit about what um, what exactly this means. Um, nowadays, all the married men live like bachelors, uh, and all the bachelors like married men. Well, obviously, the the principal differences between married men and bachelors are to do with uh, marriage and um, and having children. So there's a there's a, a, implicitly a sort of sexual uh, uh, undercurrent to to this distinction between married men and bachelors. So married men live like bachelors. The bachelors like married men implies that the bachelors. Um, are not constrained. They're not celibate. They're not um, uh, constrained not not to have uh, sex lives. Um, but also, the married men live like bachelors. The other implication, possibly to be read in this, is that to choose to be a bachelor, to choose not to marry, also potentially suggests a lack of attraction to the opposite sex. That in in, in Wilde's writings, uh, particularly, there seems to be available in the picture of Dorian Gray, the possibility of reading that phrase. Nowadays, all the married men live like bachelors to suggest a kind of well, certainly a homosocial culture um, in which men um, seek out each other's company rather than um, mixed gender company, but also potentially beyond that, and uh, there may be a kind of a, more of a homoerotic kind of uh, implication to that. And that's something which seems to be uh, then followed up in the the following um, exchange between Lord Henry Wotton and um, Lady Narborough. Uh, Lord Henry Wotton um, remarks fin de siècle as a kind of way of uh, of explaining it all, that is part of this kind of um, rejection of the old, the kind of embrace of new, different sorts of things. It's about that sort of ending of, of all the kind of the old certainties. Fan de globe, answers his hostess. It's not the end of the century, in other words. It's the end of the world. If men no longer marry, if men are no longer interested in women and having children, then it's the end of the world. It's, it's the implication that, uh, that uh, of, of Lady Narborough's response. To which Dorian says, I wish it were fan de globe, life is a great disappointment. So Dorian takes it on a slightly different tack. She suggests it's the end of the world because there will be no more families, there will be no more children. Dorian wishes it were the end of the world because life is a great disappointment. In other words, because he's consumed by ennui, having been enabled to pursue whatever kinds of vices and entertainments uh, of any kind that he wishes by virtue of the fact that he's effectively changed places with his portraits. He no longer bears the marks of, of kind of um, vice and, and, and fast living. He's, he's sort of exhausted the possibilities of that. He's, he's consumed with ennui, he's bored. Um, and that again is something which is picked up uh, by Lady Narborough when she remarks that Lord Henry is very wicked and I sometimes wish that I had been. So there's, there's no longer a kind of um, moral uh, value uh, associated with that kind of behaviour, pursuit of vice, or whatever it might be, or, or, or kind of sexual peccadilloes. I mean, none of this is stated explicitly, it's all kind of there by implication. But Lord Henry is very wicked, and she sometimes wishes that she had been. You know, there's also, within this, a kind of, uh, a, a sort of loosening of the, uh, the, the, the gender norms around femininity as well, so that for her to say that is seen as a kind of mark of her, her liberation, her, of her kind of intellectual uh, independence and, and kind of wittiness. Um, but then she says, Dorian. Uh, but you are made to be good. You look so good. And of course, that's at the, the core of uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, that, that slippage between the idea of good uh, as a moral value and looking good as, as an aesthetic one. Um, 
and that sort of slippage between the, the moral and the aesthetic is something which um, is found throughout Wilde's writings and indeed is a, is a, a commonplace in relation to the idea of decadence more generally. Um, and also that sense of ennui and boredom uh, in this um, cartoon by George du Maurier um, entitled Fantasy Eckler. We have two uh, women dressed in the fashions of the, the Fantasy Eckler period um, walking along together and having a conversation. Uh, one of them says to the other, that's where poor Mrs Wilkins used to live. Why poor Mrs Wilkins? Well, her husband was killed in that horrid railway accident, don't you remember? Oh, but that was months ago. Um, like all these 19th century cartoons, not something which probably will have you rolling around laughing, but um, the joke here, uh, such as it is, is at the expense of that kind of studied nonchalance, the uh, the, the sense of ennui, of boredom, that even something like um, the, the death of someone's husband in a, in a horrible railway accident very much, you know, a, a, a modern 19th century phenomenon, um, is something which is seen to be irrelevant now. That was months ago, you know, that, that the emotional life of the individual is itself mapped onto those short-term cycles like fashion, you know, that um, sensation can only be sustained, emotional um, turmoil and intensity is something which can only be sustained for a very short period of time. Couldn't be a greater contrast, of course, to Queen Victoria herself, you know, who stayed in mourning for the majority of her adult life. Um, and the idea of decadence, of late 19th century decadence, also brought with it um, some developments in terms of literary genre. Um, the first of these, most obviously, being aestheticism, um, which is associated with uh, Oscar Wilde though in fact has its roots um, a generation previously um, with the Pre-Raphaelites, um, with Ruskin and with Walter Pater. Um, Walter Pater in particular was a, a strong influence on Wilde um, insofar as he saw the, the purpose of life um, as being the, the maximisation of pleasure, of, of extracting the most variety um, and intensity of, of aesthetic sensations uh, that one could fit into one's life. Um, in other words, the purpose of life was not about fulfilment uh, of any kind of spiritual need or, or pursuit of any kind of um, honourable or grand purpose. It was simply about the, the pleasures of consumption and maximising the pleasures of consumption. It, obviously, strongly linked to um, to that sort of sense that we have in Schopenhauer of the kind of um, the oscillation between um, the pain of of, of denial, uh, you know, the pain of desire, and the boredom which arises from repeated fulfilment of desire. That notion of ennui. So aestheticism. You know, in a sense, is a kind of naive take on that. It's the idea that the um, the pursuit of pleasure is something which can be endlessly sustained. Uh, in Pater, that's uh, the, the form that takes is through the pursuit of, of increasingly refined and an exquisite kinds of uh, of aesthetic pleasure, rather than the kind of the, the crude kind of base pleasures of you know drinking absinthe or smoking um, opium in a hooker pipe or whatever it might be that, that Baudelaire's talking about. But you also have with aestheticism in the, the, the following generation, the generation of Wilde and people like Aubrey Beardsley, who was the artist that drew this uh, illustration here from uh, Wilde's Salome, you have um, a, a more kind of uh, explicitly eroticised notion of, of aesthetic pleasure. Um, so here, this is a, a, an illustration of Salome holding the severed head of John the Baptist, which was the thing that she demanded um, as her sort of payment for dancing for Herod. Um, and it's all done very artificially. Um, it's it, it, and it's kind of strangely dehumanised, so that the blood falling from the severed head of John the Baptist itself forms into um, the the sort of basis for these uh, flowers growing at the bottom. Um, the the figures that are drawn in Beardsley's uh, illustrations are also um, often very kind of androgynous. Um, so there's a kind of sexual ambiguity about them as well. So aestheticism is one of these sort of tendencies that develops um, within decadence, and uh, certainly the, the kind of second generation. Um, there are also um, the examples of, uh, of what was called new woman fiction, the emergence um, in the fin de siècle period um, of a new model of femininity, if you like, the, the figure of the new woman um, who is variously constructed as either being um, sexually unconstrained or being um, so asexual 
um, as to be completely uh, uninterested in, in men, um, or to have acquired the characteristics that are assumed to be masculine uh, and the province of men. Um, but in general, what it reflects is the um, emergence in the latter part of the 19th century um, of uh, a women's movement, um, beginning around people like Josephine Butler, um, who, who acted um, in, in, in campaigning against the Sexual uh, Con uh, Contagious Diseases Acts in the 1860s, um, but by the end of the century has, has sort of um, taken on, on a more kind of substantial media representation and, and is discussed in these terms of the new woman. And there are a number of novelists who write, people like Grant Allen, who, who write novels that specifically feature um, characters who are, you know, who are identified as, as new women who, who um, act in, in a way which is characteristic of that sort of uh, media stereotype and representation. Um, and then we have um, the, the new Gothic um, in the late 19th century. The, uh, the original sort of Gothic uh, novel of the um, late 18th and early 19th century was already um, falling out of favour and subject to ridicule when Jane Austen wrote uh, Northanger Abbey. But there is this resurgence in the late 19th century of the Gothic um, in, in a in modified form. Um, the Gothic is often associated with moments of sort of cultural transition uh, and, and and sort of tensions around um, identities. And the fin de siècle is, of course, a period that's that's you know ripe with all these sorts of um, tensions and, and negotiations. Uh, and the new Gothic reflects that. So that on the one hand you have this. Um, contradictory notion of the new woman is either being sort of excessively sexually liberated or being um, uh, characterised by masculine um, qualities. Both of these feature, for example, in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, the image here is of Henry Irving, who um, was the, the, the great stage actor of the late 19th century, uh, who was managed by Bram Stoker as he was his theatrical manager. Uh, and to some extent, um, is, is, is considered to, to have been one of the templates for the figure of Dracula. Um, but in that novel, you have um, the figure of this sort of sexually um, li liberated or, or, or kind of um, openly uh, exploring her sort of sexual desire in the figure of Lucy Westenra. Um, and in the figure of Mina Harker, you have a much more obvious sort of example of the new woman as someone who is uh, uh, interested in having a, co a career, who is engaged with contemporary technology, whether that's um, telegraphs or typewriters or bicycles, whatever it might be. And of course you have the sexual ambivalence of the um, central character himself, Dracula, um, who is uh, in the way that he um, creates vampires by um, uh, by feeding them his own blood uh, and, and feeding blood from his breast, um, you know, seems to have maternal qualities as well as being a, a sort of an obvious kind of um, hyper-masculine sexual predator of this typical gothic variety. Um, and then there's also um, people like Thomas Hardy and and uh, uh, across the channel, Emil Zola writing uh, fiction, which um, extends the ideas of realism, a fiction which uh, concentrates on the on the you know the realities of of daily life for ordinary people. But in in the hands of uh, Zola and to some extent in the hands of Hardy, that uh, concentrates not simply on ordinary life but on you know the the, the seamy. Uh, side of life. Uh, Zola was often castigated as, as kind of, you know, sort of re reveling in the material of the gutter. And, and Hardy, um, well, his last novel, Jude the Obscure, was received a sort of critical panning along those sorts of lines. And, he, and for that reason, he gave up writing fiction um, after Jude the Obscure and wrote nothing but poetry thereafter for the, the rest of his career. Much of it then controversial, much of it then directly engaged with exploring these sorts of tensions and uh, and uh, anxieties that are, are manifest in the culture um, of the late 19th century period. So, from decadence to degeneration. Degeneration um, can be seen as the um, cultural and physiological counterparts to those um, artistic and intellectual tendencies that we find in the idea of decadence. So, whereas Decadence is, is really a, a sort of an intellectual movement uh, or an artistic movement. Degeneration is seen as something which is less conscious, um, less about um, uh, new trends, new developments in, uh, in, in culture, and instead is seen as a kind of 
a process driven by something else. Um, that sense of an ending, that sense of the fin de siècle, therefore has a, a slightly more uh, sinister aspect in that it's seen as either the, um, the, the moment of uh, a, a cultural decline, a, a social decline, that, that the fabric of society itself is starting to fall apart, um, or on the other hand that there is uh, indeed a kind of post-Darwinian idea in degeneration that it is about evolution um, going into reverse, that there is um, a kind of parting of um, the species and there are certain elements with it which are sort of um, going off in a different direction that are becoming kind of uh, ingrained physiologically and um, anthropologically criminal. Um, to begin with um, morality, um, I've got here uh, a poster um, for a concert at the Moulin Rouge um, for the famous dancer La Goulou, who's dancing the Can Can. You can see um, the silhouettes in the background of um, an audience uh, celebrating, watching this, wearing their top hats and, and finery. Um, La Goulou was, uh, was a, a, one of the most popular dancers. Herself uh, notoriously um, became alcoholic uh, and a prostitute and so forth. One of the things that you have therefore represented here is the coming together of um, a kind of a, a public culture, one which um, is advertised by uh, posters by um, leading artists of the period here, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec um, produces poster, which is celebrating a culture in which well-dressed uh, individuals go to attend events, which are really um, the sorts of events that would have been uh, associated with uh, with brothels. Um, so you have this sort of sense of public morals being under threat, particularly in the context of, of Paris and, uh, and, and, uh, and the, the Moulin Rouge. But you have also here in, um, in this artwork, um, this um, Arts uh, Nouveau um, poster, a coming together on the one hand of that sort of um, notion of, of artistic decadence, of artistic modernity, you know, embracing new forms, producing a different kind of um, art than had been seen previously. Um, and on the other hand, you have the, the kind of commercial dimension of this, that these are posters for, for popular entertainment events. Um, so again, you've got not only that sort of sense of the kind of, um, you know, higher society coming together with what we're seeing as the kind of, you know, the sort of vicious um, uh, under elements or underbelly of that, that society um, in, in the, the, the venue of the Moulin Rouge, but also in the artwork, you've got that kind of melding of, of, of commerce and uh, and sort of traditional artistic values that suggest that maybe something is is different here. Uh, another example of this, uh, a poster here for um, Absinthe, La Fée Vert, um, the Green Fairy. Similarly, kind of if you think about the uh, the Aubrey Beardsley illustration that I uh, I showed a moment ago, with the kind of the tendril like um, hair and, and and so forth, this sort of imagery of snakes and those sorts of things on here. Um, this is you know. Um, very much a, a kind of an associated kind of representation, but here it's a, again an advertisement celebrating and uh, and and trying to sell um, the the absinthe as the kind of spirit of the period. Um, and uh, somewhat farcically, um, but also associated with this, and another example of uh, the same kind of thing. Uh, one of the other sort of um, most popular stage acts of the period, uh, along with La Goulou, was Le Petoman. Uh, Le Petto Man um, had, uh, if you haven't um, heard of him before, had a, a fairly uh, unique kind of uh, talent which uh, he, uh, he based his stage act on. We have here a piece of extant footage which mercifully has no sound associated with it, but um, you will no doubt gather from watching it uh, what his act consisted of. Um, he was an impressionist of sorts. Um, and he delivered his impressions into an amplifying uh, trumpet. Um, Le Petterman meant literally the farting maniac, and this was his act. Um, you know, uh, it was popular with audiences, um, but indicating also, uh, you know, that sort of sense in which the the moral values of the period and the ideas of propriety, sobriety, and so forth were clearly, um, you know. In question, if not being uh, explicitly undermined, and uh, and and um, and so that 
notion of a kind of moral degeneration, particularly associated with French popular entertainments and that notion of the fin de siècle, the kind of Frenchness that runs throughout all of that, um, is, is an important um, aspect of it. But more seriously and worryingly, there are, of course, uh, a number of um, sort of criminal um, events, criminal trials, which uh, have a, a particular kind of iconic significance in the late 19th century. Here, um, a newspaper um, advertisement uh, about, or a piece of news rather, about the um, the Jack the Ripper murders, the Whitechapel murders uh, in 1888, um, which again brought together anxieties about um, prostitution, the East End of London, um, sexual tourism and slumming it of sort of upper and upper, upper middle class men in, going into the East End, um, the suspicions that it was uh, a man from a higher class who was perpetrating this because of the, the nature of the, uh, the the attacks, which seemed to have suggest some kind of um, education in, in anatomy and, and surgical skill and so forth. Um, but that was clearly something which um, had huge um, social and cultural resonances and echoes throughout um, the well, a picture of Dorian Gray and uh, and, and beyond, um, placing um, masculinity in, in question uh, in general. Uh, the other aspect of this, of course, um, the famous trial of Oscar Wilde uh, in 1895 for gross indecency uh, when he was prosecuted and sentenced for two years hard labour at Reading Jail, uh, bankrupted and, and all his effects sold off. Um, and that is often taken as the kind of... Um, the uh, watershed moment, really, in the formation of uh, kind of a representation of male homosexuality um, in the Wild Trials. It was, a, it was a first really spectacular public one, and of course brings together the idea of artistic decadence and some sort of sense of moral and criminal degeneration um, through the figure of Wild. And again, as we've uh, we, we've already seen in um, novels like A Child of the Jago, that preoccupation with the East End with the idea of a sort of criminalised um, underclass, here represented in Booth's um, poverty maps by the, the black and dark blue elements, particularly the black ones, which um, are described as being um, vicious, semi-criminalised uh, populations. Uh, here, of course, what we have is the uh, Old Nickel area, Old Nickel Street there, which corresponds to Old Jago Street on the, uh, in the map at the start of Arthur Morrison's novel. Um, the area in uh, Bethnal Green, in the East End of London. So there's degeneration. That sort of sense that that society um, is coming apart at the seams. Um, the response to that. Well, there are uh, there are many responses to that. I'm just going to focus really on on two um, reasonably briefly to uh, to start bringing things to a close. The first of these is is scientism. Um, scientism being distinct from science in that. Um, science has a, a strict purview of, uh, of what its, uh, its objects are and what its, uh, its method is. Scientism, on the other hand, is that kind of extension of um, the values of science and of the scientific establishment to, to uh, wider cultural issues. So one of the um, advocates of, of or kind of uh, spokespeople of, uh, of scientism in the um, sort of mid to late 19th century and sort of 1870s or thereabouts was uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, um, Darwin's bulldog, as he was sometimes referred to, um, who was very dismissive of um, of religion, um, of the idea of spirituality, and so forth, and and fought very aggressively um, to promote and and, and promulgate the uh, the concept of evolution. To his left, we have uh, Francis Galton, um, not Darwin's bulldog, but Darwin's cousin, um, and Galton, very influenced by Darwin um, and Darwinian ideas himself something of a, a polymath, um, talented and, and, and inventive in all sorts of ways. But one of the ideas that, that very much interested Galton was the idea of eugenics, that is to say, of selective breeding, um, selecting the, the most um, desirable traits and characteristics of not just animals but of, of human beings, and, and recommending um, the non-breeding um, of individuals who do not possess those characteristics. So this is part and parcel of that idea of there being a sort of anthropologically distinctive and identifiable uh, groups of people who whose genes we would we would think of it in terms of genes now, but whose whose traits, whose heritable characteristics should not be passed on to the next generation in order to instead of um, having this sense of degeneration, but 
where would be an idea of eugenics of promoting um, you know good breeding good patterns of breeding and, and therefore promotes a, a positive evolution so one response to this is this scientific response to in other words try to understand what's happening in the 19th century by looking at it in these sort of long uh, biological narratives of, of evolution you know the, the the changes that took place in the 19th century took place over a, a relatively short period of time um, you know a long time in terms of human lifespan but but you know uh, the, the blink of an eye in terms of the sort of the huge time scales involved in evolutionary change um, but nonetheless by the, by the fin de siècle that that sort of discourse of science and scientism had such force and power and authority that it shaped and influenced the way that people were responding to these you know much more um, rapid changes on the other side of the equation you have um, people like Arthur Conan Doyle and Frederick Myers who um, whilst influenced by scientific ideas uh, took a, a slightly different approach to it and, and were very interested in the ideas of spiritualism um, and psychical research. Frederick Myers was the founder of the Society for Psychical Research. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle um, particularly from um, from the, uh, the sort of 1890s and on, onwards and indeed after the First World War he fully converted to spiritualism. But both of them were very interested in, in pursuing the irrational and pursuing the ways in which some of the um, groups of people treated by um, by theorists of degeneration as being in some way primitive or backwards. So um, people from supposedly less um, civilised cultures, women, the working classes and so forth, were viewed by the likes of Myers and, and Conan Doyle as people who weren't degenerate, but rather they saw them as uh, what they sometimes called progenerate. That is to say, they uh, had access to spiritual um, or, or psychic capacities which had atrophied in uh, in more uh, civilised, middle-class, um, westernised individuals. So they were interested in the possibility that degeneration, as, as it was described by scientists, might actually be looking at the thing through the wrong end of, uh, wrong end of the lens, that, um, that what uh, society needed to do in some sense was look to rediscover some of these lost capacities. Uh, we can find similar sorts of arguments in relation to imperialism, which is the, the last thing I'm going to look at now, where um, some of the um, sort of sense of ennui, and boredom and exhaustion that was associated with the late 19th century, it's, um, people try to uh, inv reinvigorate um, uh, identity and, and character through the, uh, the vehicle of imperialism. That imperialism and the pursuit of empire and adventure are seen as ways of getting out of that kind of metropolitan, uh, over-refined, decadent kind of culture uh, into something more virile. Um, we can see examples of this in people like um, uh, Cecil Rhodes, represented here um, as a sort of colossus bestriding um, the African continent, holding a telegraph wire that runs from Cairo to the, Cairo to the, uh, the South African Cape. Um, that was Rhodes's um, sort of uh, iconic uh, image for the, the kind of the, the British conquest of Africa. Um, it's sort of imperial dominance in the continent. After the, the imperial scramble for Africa in the 1880s when all the other European uh, major powers and America sought to, uh, to carve out a piece of it for themselves. Um, so there is this sort of sense that uh, the empire is kind of a, as a new destiny, that empire is a way in which this sort of innovated British culture will, will somehow kind of reinvigorate itself by imposing itself on the rest of the um, the, the world, but also beyond that, in particular, it was focused upon um, on on boys, on on youthful masculinity. The experience of the um, the uh, first Boer War had, um, had shown, amongst other things, that um, the urban population of young men was um, physically very unfit and feeble in comparison with the um, the sort of strapping youths um, who were the sons of uh, the Boers, the the, uh, the South African white settler farmers. So one of the things that came out of that was a desire to kind of reinvigorate this sort of um, degenerating uh, masculinity through stereotypically manly pursuits. And this manifested itself in a number of ways. The Boy Scout movement a little bit later was one example of that. But another one is um, the, the uh, uh, publishing of the Boy's Own Paper, which was launched in uh, 1879, um, but, but certainly sort of gathered pace and had become a, a very significant um, Sort of presence within sort of, uh, publishing for for young uh, boys um, by the uh, by the eighteen nineties. Uh, 
which which celebrated the kind of values of of empire, of, of virility, of, of indeed violence. Even though it was published by the Religious Tract Society, it never, uh, and quite deliberately, never was preachy, never sort of promoted Christian values particularly. It was always much more interested in promoting a sort of sense of, of kind of a virile masculinity, which was uh, which is quite happy to engage with violence, as in this uh, this illustration from the uh, the first volume. But it was all very well playing up the idea of empire. The realities, though, were slightly more sobering. Um, as you can see from this uh, image of Victoria from the year of her Diamond Jubilee, the Queen was getting old. She'd been on the throne for 60 years. Um, clearly, she couldn't last forever. And nor, for that matter, could that sort of ebullient confidence in the British Empire be something which could just be taken for granted, as this poem by Rudyard Kipling from 1897 attests, uh, this 1897, that same year of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, where Kipling wrote, Far cooled, our navies melt away, On dune and headland sinks the fire, Lo, all our pomp of yesterday Is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Judge of the nations, spare us yet, Lest we forget, lest we forget. The, uh, the empires of Nineveh and Tyre, of course, empires of the past long since fallen into, uh, into ruin. And this is what, of course, Kipling is urging his uh, his readers to remember the, uh, the the hubris that's associated with empire and with uh, with imperialism is something which presides over the fact that empire really is about an overstretching of of resources. It's a it's a uh, you know it's a confidence trick. It's uh, it's it's all about a, a kind of celebration of uh, and and placing of, of faith in an idea that whose, whose material reality and whose possibilities are forever on the brink of uh, of ruin. So that's the that's the it really. Um the fin de siècle. Um what I'm hoping will have come out of this apart from some of the specific things I've talked about in detail is that sort of sense that throughout the things I've been talking about there are different directions that people want to go off in. Um, whether it's um, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche having different takes on the idea of pessimism, whether it's the idea of ennui as something which is a kind of thing to be feared and, and treated with horror, or whether, like Baudelaire, it's something which is, is kind of fascinating and characteristic of the 19th century, something to be explored. Um, whether decadence and degeneration are seen as um, kind of terminuses, endpoints, um, declines of um, the things which are... You know, the, the great signature characteristics of the Victorian age, or whether they are rather kind of outgrowths which um, suggest new possibilities, um, as in scientism, the idea of eugenics, uh, or the idea of um, psychical research and spiritualism, uh, both of which, um, in, in variously wrong-headed ways, seek to discover new kinds of possibilities emerging from this idea of, of a kind of a sense of an ending. Um, or with imperialism, the idea both of empire itself being something which is on the brink of collapse or imperialism as being this kind of um, horizon of new possibilities. All those things are there and kind of all swilling around and, and contradicting each other in this, this cultural formation which we call for want of, of a better term and, and for the sake of, of ease of reference the fin de siècle. <laughs>